everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I really appreciate everyone taking their time uh, to come here today. Um, it's really an honor for me to be here and see everybody in the audience. Um, time, as we know, is a non-renewable resource, right? Uh, we only have a limited amount of time here on this planet, so I appreciate you taking your time to spend that here with us today at this event. So thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank the Creative Mornings team, uh, everyone who's volunteered their time to help out with today, and a special thanks to Noelle and to Nikki um, for checking in on me over the last few weeks and just uh, helping me along the way. So thank you, everybody. Um, so first question is, why are we here today? Um, we're here to talk about the topic of simplicity. Um, and today I'd like to talk about that through the lens of art, but also the lens of luck. Um, first off, in speaking about simplicity, I'd like to establish one thing. Uh, because I do think people have different ideas of what simplicity is. So um, I would like to start off by saying that simplicity is a process. Uh, it's not just a thing that we attain or an end goal um, or even a thing that exists on its own, um, but it is a process. Oftentimes, I think we get caught up in looking at terms or concepts from kind of this very like black and white perspective. Things are either this or that or here or there uh, or one or the other. Uh, but the thing about doing that or looking at things like that is that even if that kind of view makes you feel more secure, uh, it's kind of an illusion because that's just not the way things are. Uh, most of the time, even if things are seemingly polar opposites, uh, they're often just a piece of each other and they actually can't exist alone. Uh, so with simplicity, um, it's just one side of a process that also contains its polar opposite. And for the sake of today, I'm going to call that polar opposite complicating. Um, I know that that kind of has a negative connotation maybe to some people, but there's nothing negative about it. It is just the opposite of simplicity. Um, so on one side of this process, you can kind of think of concepts like simplicity, minimizing, uh, simplifying, taking away, editing. Um, and on this other side of this process, we have concepts like uh, complicating, adding. Um, I would even put in like brainstorming on that side of that process, um, collecting, building up. All of those things are kind of on the other side. Um, and I'm going to say it again just one more time, but one is never without the other. They are always together. They have um, a relationship, even though they're opposites. There they are, kind of moving back and forth with each other in almost like a dance, right? Adding and taking away, um, creating tension and movement, also creating insight, and really highlighting what's important to us as we kind of flow between these things. So um, just to kind of walk through a little bit of a, like an example with that um, together, uh, just for an example. Um, I don't know where you guys come up with your good ideas, but sometimes let's say you are in the shower or in your car or you are wherever your good ideas come to you and you get a thought and it's a first thought. So it tends to kind of be simple at first, but then you're intrigued by it, you think about it, you brainstorm, and you kind of move to the other side. You start to complicate. You then probably realize you have way too much information or way too many thoughts in one place, so you start to take away. You go back to the other side, you simplify. Um, you take your best ideas, you write probably way too much about them, uh, you complicate again, and then you realize you have to edit, so you take away again. You're just kind of always moving back and forth. Um, and that movement, um, that back and forth movement is key. Um, our ability to transition between both opposites, it's how life happens. It's how ideas become reality, um, and it's how we bring our dreams to life. 
Um, so great news. Um, I'm actually not just standing here telling you all to simplify, minimize, get rid of all your things, clean out your closets, um, although I do think uh, people could probably benefit from that <laughs> advice. Um, that is not what I'm asking you to do today. Um, but what I would like to do is ask you just kind of for a minute to just think about your own life um, through the lens of this simplicity process. Uh, what is the object of your attention? Right now, what can you not stop thinking about? Uh, do you have an idea for a project? Are you just starting something? Do you have um, perhaps a problem you're being faced with that you're looking for an answer to? Um, maybe you don't have either one of those things. Um, and in that case, you can just kind of think about your life or your path, kind of where you are right now. Where are you? Um, are you adding? Are you taking away? Uh, and also, where do you want to be? Is that a different place from where you are? Um, so just think about that for a minute um, and kind of let that be the backdrop uh, to this talk as we continue to kind of move on in a different direction for a minute. Um, so some of you might be thinking right now, like, okay, thank you, Kenley, I'm thinking about my life. Thank you for your thoughts about simplicity, but uh, who are you and what authority do you have to talk about this topic? Um, so uh, just to introduce myself a little bit again, my name is Kenley Darling. As you may already know, um, I'm an artist and an illustrator that's been living here in the Seacoast for 20 years. Um, although my art has changed, uh, many times over the years, and I feel like I've kind of reinvented myself through my art. Um, currently, I'm probably best known for my mural work. Uh, like Noelle said, it's very public. I'm sure that maybe uh, people have seen it around town. Um, I'm also probably known for some of my good luck stickers, as luck is often a common theme in a lot of my art, uh, but my mural work is probably what I'm best known for. Um, so I'd like to just show you some photos of that, if I can work this correctly right here. Um, this right here is the Shalimar mural. Um, this uh, is actually extended. Since this picture was taken, there's, there's more art kind of further down the wall there. Uh, if you haven't seen it in real life, it is walking distance from where we are today. So if you want to head over to the Shalimar uh, after this and see it with your own eyes in real life, you can go over there and enjoy it. Um, but I think this is probably one of the, my favorite murals I've ever painted. Uh, part of that reason is probably because I do think it brings the community a lot of joy. And because it's right up the street, I get to see it and I get to see people interact with it. And I always get so excited uh, when I get to see that. Um, but um, as you can see, I often use uh, simple lines and shapes to create patterns. And then I use those patterns to create murals. I'm often using like very simple shapes. I like triangles circles, semicircles, kind of these very basic, simple shapes. But when you play with those shapes and when you complicate those shapes, kind of move in the opposite direction, you create something like this, uh, like this mural. Um, it's, it's funny because uh, when I do start to create murals, I often use, like put limitations in place before I even begin. So I will say things to myself like, okay, you have three shapes and five colors, or you have four shapes and four colors. And I kind of set up these limitations when I first start um, because it helps me from the beginning. And the reason why it helps me is because I'm a natural complicator. <laughs> True confessions. Um, I am a natural complicator. I will overthink. I will overdo. Uh, I will overexplain, as that might happen today. Uh, you can ask my son. Uh, he he hears me overexplain often, um, but. That's just how I am naturally. So sometimes it's good to have kind of these limitations or restrictions in place from the beginning. It's like having like a simplifying gate just in place before I even start. And it keeps me kind of on track. And so I tend to do that with all of my murals and most things that I make. Um, so uh, that's just a little picture of me painting downtown. Um, this right here is the Earth Eagle mural. 
Um, that's also walking distance to here. Um, that was a mural I painted as a, a, a collaboration with my friend and painting partner, Scott Chassie. Uh, we've done a lot of paintings together. This was one of our first commercial murals, so the pattern is very simple. But I think it's bright, it's bold, I love the colors. Um, in this one, we were kind of figuring out logistics. I love how that line kind of crosses through like the windows. I don't know if you can even see that. It's so simple, but it adds so much to the mural. And um, Earth Eagle loved it so much, they put it on their beer cans. So if you ever get the beer cans, you'll see like on the bottom, this like kind of pattern around the bottom that's just like that. Uh, so that would be the Earth Eagle mural. Um, this right here is a mural that wasn't, it's not a permanent mural, it was an installation at the Extension Gallery down in Boston. Um, it kind of throws your eye off a little bit. I think the lines on the side, it's just kind of simple, but you know, you kind of make you question like, is the wall straight? Is this, where am I? Is the wall moving? You kind of do a double take, but I do enjoy that. Um, this right here, uh, this is another um, temporary mural, not a permanent one. Um, that one was painted at the Calico Gallery in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I love the way that it comes down onto the floor. Um, this was a really exciting mural for me to paint. Uh, some murals I just love, and I don't know if it's because of the end result or if it's because of the way I feel when I'm actually painting, or maybe it's just a combination of both. Um, but it's funny because like when I was a kid, I grew up, you know, before the internet, so I couldn't type in like geometric bold murals and have thousands of examples come to me at my fingertips. I only really saw what was in front of me, you know, or unless I saw it in a movie or like a book or a magazine or something. Um, so I didn't really, as a kid, really see a lot of mural work. It just wasn't in front of me. Um, I loved Keith Haring uh, as an artist when I was young, and um, Keith Haring's probably so well known for his like simple, bold lines. Um, but when I was like 14 or 15, someone got me, you know, a paper calendar, 52 weeks, and uh, every week had a different picture. And I remember like looking through it and just being like, "This is so incredible! Like, I can't believe all of these images. It's so cool." And then I just flipped through and I saw a picture of a mural that he had painted that was like 60 feet high. And I was so inspired by it and like really in awe because I'm like, if this person can paint something six inches and then paint it like 60 feet, like that's it, that's art. He's an artist, that's insane. I just thought it was really incredible. Um, so in my mind, that's I had this kind of like, wow, like if he could do that. And for some reason, like when I painted this mural, I felt like I had just had a moment where I was like, I think, I think I'm doing this. This is, I'm doing this, I'm painting big, this is great. And um, so I just really love this one. Um, it has kind of a special place uh, in my heart right there. Um, this right here is a residential mural that I painted again with Scott uh, Chassis um, down in Strasburg, Virginia. Um, I was going to say what actually looking at it, like this looks like a pretty simple mural, but I don't know if it does. Now I'm like, I don't know. Do you, I don't know. Does it look simple? Uh, to me, it looks pretty simple. Like you're just really using, I mean, there's one shape, I mean, maybe two triangles. Um, you know, the colors are, you know, uh, varied, but um, people say this all the time, right? Simple things are not easy. You remove that thought. If you think that, just remove it. They're just, simple things are not easy. Simple things are usually pretty complicated, right? Again, existing together. So this mural, although it looks pretty simple, when you, the layout of this mural was kind of insane. Uh, there's, I think, a picture here. So that's us trying to figure it out. <laughs> or not us there, but, um, you know, we had like, three people on um, the scaffolding. We had someone way back, you know, do the lines look straight? It was also on vinyl siding, which I don't know if you can imagine, but the vinyl siding, trying to make a straight line on vinyl siding is difficult. And so we would make these lines and then look back and go, no, that, that's nope, not straight at all. And so then we'd have to like go back and figure things out and change things um, and adjust. So 
Uh, although, yeah, that was the end result. The process was, um, was pretty complicated. Um, this is another example. Um, this is just a small mural in White Plains, New York. Uh, it looks, uh, you know, the lines look pretty straight, I hope, uh, from the front. <laughs> uh, but from the side, if you look at the side, like making all of those lines and, and, and connecting all of those things, there's a lot of complicated math and uh, <laughs> figuring things out uh, when you paint the mural. I actually kind of like <laughs> from the side. I mean, I like it from the front, of course, but um, the side view is so cool to me to see all of the intricate kind of ins and outs on how that was made. Um, so this one right here, uh, that is a mural, believe it or not. So Cafe Killam, which is right down the street, the mobile is right behind that. I don't know you the, like the building on the top is mobile. <laughs> so the so if you're behind mobile, that's a residential um, mural that I painted in someone's patio, but it is my favorite colors. Like if someone said to me you can only use five colors for the rest of your life, what would they be? It would be dark green, avocado green, bright red, pink and yellow. Those are those are my colors. Uh, this right here is my own studio in Dover. So when I could kind of paint whatever I wanted on my own wall, I used those colors uh, to paint that mural. Um, and just to go through these quickly, that's Cake Vegan Bakery, also in Dover. Um, that's Don Darrow School. I think we have some teachers in the house somewhere taught at Don Darrow. So that's on their school. Um, this is an example of just size. Uh, this mural, you know, just using squares, circles, and four basic colors, it just gives you the scale of like how little I am painting and how big those shapes are. And that mural goes on for like maybe 70, 80 feet. It's the whole side of like a parking area out in Kingston, New York. Um, and this right here is White Heron, uh, which we all love, right? We all love White Heron. Uh, that's my most recent mural. Um, it's funny because I think that when it comes to like colors and patterns, when one side gets a little complicated, the other side has to get simple. So if you use a complicated pattern, it's kind of best to keep the colors simple. But if you use like a lot of colors, it's best to keep the pattern simple. Kind of works both ways. So for this one, I feel like we used a lot of colors and tried to keep the pattern pretty simple. Um, so that's an example of just some of the murals that I've painted. Uh, but prior to making murals, I, well, I probably started painting murals in 2017, so it's been about six years now. Uh, but prior to that, I've always been in, you know, Portsmouth making art, but in different ways. Uh, I started off by making good luck stickers. I then created something that I called the uh, good luck postcard project, where I sent out handmade postcards wishing people good luck. Um, I had a solo exhibit over at Nakata called A Winter Migration, where I painted a hundred 108 butterflies in one year, and I also had 108 butterflies tattooed on me in the same year. Um, this right here is a picture of me uh, at 3S during an opening. Um, so those things I'm standing on, I called good luck centers, but basically I would take a piece of wood to make those. I took pieces of wood, um, and then I took pennies, like lucky pennies that I had found, and I would flip the pennies onto the wood, and then the penny that landed heads up would then become the center of the painting. And then I would paint like bright colors, like kind of radiating uh, light and luck out from the center. I made them for the wall so people could hang them on the wall, but I also made them as platforms so people could stand on them and absorb their luck. So hopefully a lot of luck went out through that one. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, as you can see, I've made a lot of art around town um, and also out of town. Uh, but what's funny is that when I started making art, I didn't really have these like goals or aspirations. Like when, even when I saw that Keith Haring mural, I wasn't like, wow, that's going to be me. I'm going to do that someday. That really wasn't me. Like I was inspired by it. I, I loved seeing it, but I just didn't really think like that um, back then. Um, you know, I've always been 
kind of a creative person. Um, if you asked my mom, I often got in trouble for writing on the walls of my bedroom or the walls of my friend's bedroom or my arms was often, stop writing on your arms. One time at the age of six, I decided to paint my neighbor's car with a stick. So that was a fun one. Um, so I've always kind of been doing creative things, but um, not always with these goals in mind. Um, really, when I started making art, it was very personal. And it was kind of to like heal my own heart uh, because I had a broken heart. <laughs> and art really is what brought me back to myself. Um, as a young person, just to go back a little bit even further, um, I actually, uh, I dropped out of school uh, at the age of 14. Um, I ended up in an alternative high school for a few years. Um, I then got married at the age of 19, um, and I had my, my handsome young son uh, when I was only 20. Um, so, and then after that, by the age of 23, I was found myself going through a separation, a divorce, and becoming a single parent, um, you know, all at a very young age. Um, I did kind of go back and forth about editing this part of, um, it's a little personal, about editing this part uh, of this talk out, but I think if we, in terms of like simplifying and process, if when we're editing we leave the important parts in, I do think that this is important to say. Um, things weren't exactly easy for me as a young adult. Uh, my ex-husband, uh, who is no longer with us, um, he had pretty severe uh, mental health issues, and he suffered from addiction, uh, losing his life just last year to a drug overdose. Um, yeah, so I'm sure uh, that there's people in the audience now who, uh, you know, have loved someone that suffers from these things. Maybe it's a family member or a friend or a lover. Uh, but for all of you people, I don't really, I don't really need to say it because you know. But for those of you who might not know, um, their situation is complicated. <laughs> there is nothing simple about that situation. Uh, loving someone who is suffering so much, but who is actually also dangerous <laughs> to your own being, it's super complicated. Uh, and I was just 23, like dealing with all of this stuff. Um, this period was probably one of the most difficult times in my life. Um, I didn't spend much of that time dreaming or sleeping in or going to the beach. Um, every day I was being faced with like really challenging real life issues. And the only thing that was important to me was the well being and the survival of myself and my son. So it was a super tough time. Um, and with all of these kind of complicated um, events and emotions that were going on around me, like I needed a reprieve really, you know? I needed to kind of like access um, a simpler world while I was being faced with like a really challenging one in front of me every day. Um, also, don't get me wrong, I was still having a good time. Uh, I was still having joyous moments uh, parenting, but I don't know if you ever, you know, you ask a parent of a three-year-old, like, how's your week going? And they're like, you know, it's really calm and quiet, and I've had a lot of me time just to process everything, you know? It's just not usually the answer. Like, things are hectic, especially for a single parent. You're very busy. Um, so, uh, and through all being all of this busy and dealing with all of this, I did, like I said, I needed some quiet time. Uh, so during that time period, what I found myself doing was late at night after my son would go to sleep and I could not sleep because of anxiety, overthinking, legitimate fear, whatever it was, um, I would stay up and I would draw all night long. And I would also like to say that during this time period, I didn't have like a television or a phone or a computer, like there was no distraction. Uh, so my son would fall asleep and I would stay up and I would draw. Um, at the time, it wasn't really patterns like you see me kind of working within these murals. It was oftentimes tattoo imagery because uh, that's what I was drawn to. It was like anything with a broken heart or, <laughs> you know, anything that said lost love or like these old kind of traditional American like tattoo imagery. Um, I would stay up and I would draw all night. Um, and it was kind of in this, these moments, these quiet moments where my mind could relax a little, it could quiet. 
Um, not a lot, but just enough that my world didn't feel so heavy. Um, it was really a place where I could dream, even if it was just a little bit. I had this blank page, this pen in front of me, and I could imagine not only something I could draw there, but I could also start to imagine a new future for myself and my son. Uh, one that didn't feel so kind of heavy and challenging. Um, I was entering then what I didn't realize at the time, but I was entering then what I now like to call a world of wonder. It's a place that uh, it's not defined by science or rational thinking. Um, it was a place where my day didn't really matter. It was a place where I could access my imagination and I could also rediscover my intuition. In this world, I could believe in the unbelievable and it was totally okay. Um, now in thinking about this world, many years later and many years have passed, um, I also believe that a lot of other things live in this world. Uh, I believe that art is born in this world. I believe that all creative solutions to problems come from that world. I believe that God lives in that world and faith lives in that world and things like fate, intuition, divine timing, dreaming, all of those things live there. And I would definitely say that luck lives there. Uh, to me, luck is in fact one of the simplest, most accessible concepts through which people can actually enter that world. Right, like you can't really ask people to believe in like God or fate or the afterlife. Uh, one, because that's really none of my business if people believe in those things. Uh, two, because people have a lot of preconceived kind of notions about what those things mean to them. Um, and also I don't wanna be pushy. I'm not looking to be too pushy. Um, but luck is different. Luck is small. Luck is simple. Luck, again, is the most accessible piece of this wildly expansive world. Like, it's funny to me because sometimes you can ask people, you know, do you believe in God? No. Do you believe in fate? No. Do you believe in all of these things? No. And then you can say, do you have anything that's lucky? And then they're like, yes, I do. And then they tell you this like story about this lucky item that they have and they'll tell you the whole story about it. And it's always funny to me because it's like if you believe in luck, where do you think it comes from? <laughs> what do you think it is? I mean, think about that, you know? What is it? I believe that luck is what opens the door to the world of mystery that surrounds us. And so late at night, I would enter this world. Um, and the more I kind of entered it at night, the better I got at entering it during the day. Um, you know, that world is not only where art is born, but it's also where hope is born. And at that time, I needed hope more than I needed anything else. Um, I believe that hope is something we all need. So going back to that question that I asked you to think about earlier about your own life, what is the object of your attention? Where are you in your life right now? I asked you to think about that question through the lens of simplicity, but now I'd like you to think about it again through the lens of luck. What if luck was on your side? Would it change how you feel? What kind of choices would you make regarding that problem or that project or your life path if you knew that luck was there supporting you the whole time you moved? Like really think about that. What if luck is on your side? What if it has been the whole time? What if it's just that simple? And if you leave here today and you think about that and you still end up doubting that it exists, that's okay. Maybe you're just a skeptic through and through. And if so, if this is all silly to you, that's okay. I still love you. I do. We need you, you skeptics out there, to reel us all in, us abstract thingers, thinkers just out there in dream world, just playing make-believe. We do need you. Honestly, you are the opposite to my coin, and I couldn't exist without you. But me, I'm not a skeptic. I am a believer. I am an artist. 
I am a person who is very comfortable living in that world of wonder. But also, I am not you. You all have your own path, you have your own light, and you have your own purpose here on this planet. And so no matter who you are, no matter what you're dealing with, what you're trying to discover or create, I want you all to know that in the very simplest way that I believe that I can show you I care, and that from the bottom of my heart, I truly wish you all the best of luck. <laughs>